So what did God want? The short answer is an earthly family with him forever. It's a real simple statement, real simple recipe. God created humanity because they otherwise wouldn't exist, obviously. He didn't create humanity because there was some, like, deficiency in himself. He wanted, just like he has in the supernatural world, he wants it beings in the embodied world, the human world, and he makes the world for these beings. He wants something like him to participate with him on earth, to both enjoy the creation, to steward it, to make the rest of the world like Eden. He gives them tasks. It's for their enjoyment and his pleasure. That's the original vision You know, he has to do it because that's the only way it's going to happen. So let's talk a little bit about Eden. Eden was more than a garden. Again, if you read, you know, Unseen Realm or, you know, Supernatural, you're going to get a little bit of a discussion in Supernatural on some curiosities about Eden. And they're actually important. Eden is more than a garden. It's God's earthly home. It is superior to the rest of the earth. See, we, we grew up, I mean, I did as a, as a Christian. I became a Christian when I was a teenager. Thinking that Eden is like the whole new, the whole created world. It's not. Eden was a little tiny piece, little tiny place in the created world. How do we know that? Because Genesis 2 gives us specific geography for it. When God creates humanity, he, he tasks them with going out and subduing, stewarding the earth. Okay, if it's a perfect environment, it doesn't need that. But it, it's something lesser than what Eden is. Eden is where God himself dwells. There is perfection there. The source of life is God. You know, these sorts of big ideas. So humans are tasked to multiply, because you're going to need more than just you two, okay, to pull this off. But you essentially are supposed to make the rest of the world like this place, to spread the good rule of God everywhere, to multiply what it's like everywhere to be in the presence of God. Life as it was meant to be. Eden is also called a mountain. Ezekiel 28, we might as well click out there. A lot of people, you know, this is easy to read over, this verse, But Eden isn't just a garden. Yes, in verse 13, Eden, the garden of God. Down in verse 14, God is talking about this cherub figure, and he says, I placed you, you were on the holy mountain of God. Why is Eden described as a garden and a mountain? Is God confused? Is the writer confused? No. Gardens and mountains in ancient Near Eastern thought were the way you would describe the most wonderful environment and also the most remote environment because God is not like us. He's not us. He's he's completely other. This is why, again, across the board in ancient Near Eastern thinking, the gods live in paradise. Think about who's writing the Bible. This is a, a subsistence economy, ancient Israel, patriarchs, nomadic lifestyle. Maybe you have some settled you know, urban situations, but people are living day-to-day, hand-to-mouth. Unless you're the king or something like that, then you have a little bit better. But it's still a struggle. Well, surely the gods live in a better place than this. They do. It's a paradise. There's always enough water. There's always enough food. It's just wonderful. But they were also thought of as living in, on mountains because they're, they're other than us. And in the ancient Near Eastern world, the gods really don't want to have much to do with people. They're just kind of icky. They get, get in the way. They're irritating. You know, they snore. They make too much noise. You know, all sorts of complaints about humans. So the gods are somewhere else or they're in heaven because we don't live there. If you, if you make a, a you know, careful study of ancient Near Eastern thinking... The gods are in places humans don't live. Heavens, the seas. If you've seen it, you know, Aquaman, okay. (laughs) All right. These are places that are not for human habitation. Humans are cut off from living there. 
This is why Eden is described in these terms. It's a paradise, but it's also other. But God creates humans and puts them in this garden. It was where he was, and so where he is, his family is. We've alluded to Job 38. God's audience are the kids he already has in the supernatural world. They watch him create. And they are the audience for a momentous decision. After God lays the foundations of the world and the sons of God in Job 38 shout for joy, God has something else to tell them. And this gets us into the famous image of God passage, Genesis 1, 26 and 27. Then God said, let us make man in our image. It's Adam, humankind, is a better translation. Let us make Adam, humankind, in our image, in our likeness. Let them rule. So again, it's plural. Over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, the livestock, over all the earth, over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he he created them. So it's comprehensive, it's mankind, it's humankind, male and female. Have you ever noticed there's some strange things in this passage? If you haven't, maybe you will now, because I changed the colors of some of the words. Isn't that clever? Um, Let us make humankind in our image. You have plurals. And then in the next verse, it switches back to singulars. Is the writer confused? Did he just flunk grammar? (laughs) Now, I would suggest to you there's a point to doing that. We want to talk about that. There's lots of debate on the nature of the image. There's lots of debate on the plurals. The switch, you, you almost never hear commented on. We're going to go through all of them. Most Christians are taught that the us in the verse is the Trinity. There are a number of reasons, and I go through all of them in Unseen Realm, why that is a flawed idea. I'll just give you one. The Trinity, in any standard formulation or articulation of the doctrine, you have three co-equal, co-eternal, co-omniscient persons. They don't need information. So when God says, hey, let's make human... The other person in the Trinity, stop, I'm already there. (laughs) And and he can't say, I thought of that before you did, because they're co-eternal. Okay, so why do we even need the conversation? Because we're not dealing with the Trinity. Okay, God is speaking to his heavenly host, the the family that already exists, and he says, I got a great idea. Let's create beings who are like us on the earth. Let's like take, you know, we got this neat family here, and I love it, love you guys. And I'd like to do it again. On this time, they're going to be a little weird because they're going to have bodies. That's a little strange, a little restricted, some limitations there. But but let's do that. Now, we know, and I'll, I'll probably click out to a little bit later, that because it switches back to the singular, when God does create humanity, he is the lone creator. There are no other creators. But the plural is still there for a reason, and we'll talk about that. I want to take a bit of a rabbit trail, though, and talk about what the image is, because this is something that, you know, Stovall and I have had a number of conversations about. This is really important. And it's something that if we get a grasp of this, it will inform our identity, and not just our individual identity, but our collective identity in ways that might seem to the ear obvious, but in our culture are anything but obvious. The image of God has these characteristics in Scripture. Male and female possess it equally. It makes us distinct from all other earthly creatures. There's no hint in the text that we get it in stages, incrementally or partially. You either have it or you don't. There's no, like, growth and development into the image. 
in a human sense here in the creation. And it's passed on generationally. When Adam and Eve have children in Genesis 5, their children are said to be in the image you know, of their father, the image of, of, of Adam, his own image. In Genesis 9, that language is applied to every human being. Whosoever sheds man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God, he made man. He made humanity. And that's long after Adam and Eve. You've got lots and lots of people on the earth by the time that that statement is made. They are all imagers of God. Ooh, I said imagers. What do you mean, Mike? That's kind of an awkward term. It's actually important. Now, I'm going to put that up. A little rabbit trail here, a little story. I used to teach Christian ethics. at a. Uh, I did it at a Bible college and at a Christian college, uh, which happened to be a, a Catholic school in Wisconsin. And I loved abortion day. This gives you a little insight into my personality. You say, well, how in the world could you love abortion day? Because I knew... I would get to torment students on that day like I don't get to torment them on any other day. So what I would do is I'd go in and I'd say, hey, it's abortion day today. We're going to talk about abortion, Christian ethics. How many of you, and again, these are Christian schools, so I'd say, how many of you are pro-life? Like, you know, like every hand goes up, you know, which of course is predictable. And I would say, Why? And they would, you know, they'd look at you again like you got two heads. You know, we're Christians. And, you know, they'd go back and forth. And eventually somebody would say, well, life is sacred. And I'd say, why? And then somebody would wind up in Genesis 1, 26. And they'd say, well, because humanity is made in the image of God. And I would say, well, what does that mean? And then I would get the grocery list. See, that's what I'm waiting for is the grocery list. If you read a lot of your the theologians, what I'm, what, what I'm going to tell you is my view, is not a new view. It's, you know, I, again, Mike never had an original idea. But there are good exegetical reasons for it. But this is the grocery list. They would say things like, well, consciousness, self-awareness, sentience, the ability to pray, the ability to commune with God, emotions, having a soul or a spirit. You know, theologians land somewhere in here. And I would say, well, thank you for making a biblical pro-choice argument for me. And then they'd really look at you. And they're like, what? What, is, what do you mean? They'd be like my pug. Like, what? Okay. Why do these things fail? Because they cannot be said to be present equally among all human beings. You go back to the list. Is everybody, does everybody have the same level of intelligence? Emotional aptitude? Is everybody's conscious, conscious, conscience the same? What about people in a coma? Do they lose the image? They're no longer conscious. I mean, you, you can just go down. You, you can pick off every one of these. If we even expand it to the animal kingdom, there's a whole field in psychology called animal cognition, which is actually fun to read. It's, it's something I'm interested in, not because I have pugs. There. I don't know where pugs rank on this. But I, re I remember reading a, a study one time where chickens scored better than toddlers on an intelligence test. Because, and we have, a, we have a chicken at home. Why do we have a chicken? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> but if you let the chicken out, it, 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 it knows at night to go roost somewhere, you know, where it's safe. Like, it'll, it'll go back home. You want to do that with your toddler? Okay. That was the test. So animal intelligence, I mean, you, 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 none of these work. They're not possessed equally among all humans. They're not, they can't be said to be actually present among all humans at different stages of human development. And some aren't even unique to, to mankind. All these are connected to brain function, except for soul and spirit. And we'll get to that in a moment. But you see what I mean? The little, you know, four, six-celled zygote, the thing that attaches itself to the wall of the uterus, that ain't praying to God. That's not having a single thought. It doesn't have a brain. It's not communing with the, the, with the supernatural, with the Almighty. And then they, somebody in the audience in my ethics class would say, well, it will. 
I said, thank you. Now we have potential persons. That's a pro-choice argument. And then you'd get, I'm going to tell my pastor. I'm going to, I'm going to, after this class, I'm going to call my mom. I'm going to go to the dean. And I'm just like, look, they, they know what day it is. They're expecting you. You know, just, okay, just go ahead. This is every semester. Okay, they get it. And I would tell them, look, I'm doing this to you because I don't want someone who is hostile to your faith to do it to you because they will destroy you. Okay? It'll, it, would take, it would take five minutes to destroy you. And some would enjoy it. I mean, these ideas make you vulnerable. What about soul and spirit? Well, the Hebrew word for soul is nephesh. Guess what? Animals have that in Genesis 2-7. So that's not unique to humans. Genesis 1-21, another verse. Animals have that. Every living creature, nephesh hachaya, living creature. See, it's obscured in your English translations. You don't know that's the word for soul, but it is. They also have a ruach, the word for spirit. Ecclesiastes 3.21, it just refers to animate life. There's animate life, and then there's like plant life, okay? Man, what about the nishmat chayim, the breath of life? Well, that's nice. Genesis 7, 22 and 23 attributes that to all land animals as well. Again, it would take five minutes. So what is, okay, you know, inevitably I'd get, okay, smart guy, what is it? You know, they get, they get angry, <laughs> And I'd say, I'm glad you asked the question, because it's important. So God created man in his own image, is how most translations have this. I'm going to suggest that we need to think of the image as a function or role, rather than a quality or attribute inside a person. Because those qualities and attributes are not unique. Humans don't possess them equally. And in some cases, they can be perceived as being even lost, again, like the coma situation. The image is something that's a function. I mean, let me illustrate in English. If I say, and believe it or not, this, this is really about a single, that little preposition in. In Hebrew, it's b, the letter bet. Bet salem in the image, okay? If I say, put the dishes in the sink, the word in denotes what? Location. It's in the sink. If I say, I wrote the letter in pencil, now I'm not talking about location. I'm not using that little preposition to denote location. I'm talking about the instrument I used to do some writing, a tool. It has a totally different semantic, totally different meaning. If I say, I broke the vase in pieces, I'm not talking about instrument now or location. I'm talking about some result of some action that I did. Okay, try this one. If I say, I work in medicine, I work in ministry. I work in accounting. I work in education. What do I mean? It means I work as a doctor, a PA, a nurse. I work as a pastor. You know, somebody, you know, a staff person, some ministerial function of any kind, any type. I work as an accountant. I work as a principal, a teacher, an administrator, whatever. It describes function or role. That is what Genesis 126 is getting at. Now, I could take you into the Hebrew grammar and talk about the bet of you know, predication, the bet essentia, and all that fancy Latin grammar stuff. This is a known category for the meaning of in, function. How does it work out practically? Try to think of it as a verb rather than a noun. Every human being is an imager of God. God's original intent was to create creatures like him to essentially be him as if he were there. 
They are his proxy. They are his representative, his agent to do things. Every human being is an imager of God. Another way to illustrate this is to go to one of the Ten Commandments. This is a familiar one. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Now, we are sort of taught to think that this commandment is about swearing, you know, the, the, the verbal utterance of God's name in some defamatory or, you know, useless way. I want you to see something, again, that's obscured in English. Take is the Hebrew verb nasa. And I'm going to do, just bear with me here, I'm going to run a quick search just to show you a point. This is often the term, you'll look at the options over here, that is translated to bear, to carry, to support, to lift. Okay, it's a verb that means all those things. Lift, carry, take, take up, pick up, that sort of thing, to bear. Thou shalt not bear the name of the Lord thy God in vain. What does it mean to bear a name? It means to be associated with it. I bear the name Christian. I bear the name, you know, like Logos employee. I am an extension of that name. I'm responsible for its reputation. Okay? To bear the name means to be a representative of that name. But the New Testament expresses this really nicely when Paul tells Peter, let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Imaging God and bearing the name are two related concepts. It's really two ways of saying the same thing. Humanity was the representative of God, was the agent of God on on earth. To be human is to be the image of God. It doesn't matter if you're a few cells in a woman's womb. It doesn't matter if you're old and you've lost your memory. It doesn't matter if you're in a coma. If you are human, you are God's imager. End of story. It doesn't matter what race, what income level. I mean, look at all the ways our, our culture divides people up into groups. I mean, we live, we live in a day when the best word for it is tribalism. It's like we all want to be in, the, in these little tribes and then they fight with each other constantly. You know, it, that, is, that is so chaotically contrary to God's vision for humanity and the fact that God actually tells you how he looks at people. Every person God looks at as his representation. They are, they are him, as it were, on earth. Now that gets ruined by the fall. We enter into rebellion. We have the problem of sin. We are all in rebellion and we need to be brought back into the family of God, where we can actually function like God wants us to do, and we can actually represent him well, the way he wants things done. But every person you bump into is a potential candidate. Not, not candidate's not a really a good word, but every person you bump into is an estranged family member who was created for a specific reason, and that is to image God, to participate with God, to complete the tasks God wants, to give the earth the kind of life God wants people to have. It all goes back to Genesis 1, to this concept of imaging, bearing the name, representation. Again, in a fallen world, the redeemed are the ones who can do this as intended, and we're all estranged from God. Thankfully, we have a template. It's no coincidence that imaging language is used of Jesus. Again, it's not like a lucky, a lucky correlation. Oh, Paul got lucky. He used the word image a few times. You know, I bet he wasn't thinking about Genesis 1. I bet he was. I bet he was thinking about representation of God. 
The God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. He's the perfect image. He is the perfect representative. If you've seen me, Jesus said, you have seen the Father. God has predestinated that all who believe will ultimately be conformed to the image of his Son. Does that mean we all look like Jesus? It would be kind of sad if you're a woman. You know, just like, you know, I like the way I look, you know. We, again, look at how we think of this stuff. I'll be at my ideal weight. I'll have more hair. You know. can, can we, like, not literalize everything so often? I mean, just, there's just bigger stuff going on. You know, in, in 1 John 3, 1 John 3, it says, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called, and we should be the children of God. And then John has this little, you look it up, he has this little parenthetical thought where he says, and that's what we are. And then he goes on and says, you know, someday we will be like him. We will be conformed to his image. Believers have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. What a coincidence. We all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. To image God is to become more like him. To use Jesus as your example. You follow Jesus. You imitate Jesus. Folks, this is discipleship, which is something that's basically lost in the modern church. Okay? This is discipleship. You, be, you, you follow Jesus. You mimic him. You know, his behavior, his attitudes, what, you know, what he would do. And he he gives us plenty of examples. And when you do that, you are being conformed to his image, and he is the perfect image of God. You are fulfilling your role. This is what you were intended to be. It's what every person was intended to be. All in the same family, again, all participating with God in making the world the way God wanted it to be in the first place. That's the task. And we've quoted 2 Timothy 2.19 already. So what about the plurals? Again, I don't think this is a conundrum. Let's start with what's clear. God is the lone creator of all things in heaven and earth, visible and invisible. Earthly world, spiritual world. Colossians 1 tells us that. We image God, our creator. That is, we serve, we partner with him as his agents, his representatives, his proxies, in our sphere, which is this world. They do the same thing in their world. They have the same father, the same creator. The reason it's plural is because it loops them into the conversation, his supernatural children, the members of his host, the council, whatever, again, metaphor you you want. They image God, their creator, in the spiritual realm. We are to be mirror images, pardon the pun, it's deliberate in this case, We are mirror images of each other, as in heaven, so on earth. Okay? It's, you know, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God has two families. In Eden, because heaven came to earth, you realize again, that's what Eden is. This is where heaven comes to earth. God dwells among men. He creates a human family to coexist and co-partner with the supernatural family that already exists. Where God is, his family, his entourage is with them. He has a conversation with them. It's not the only time when he says, hey, let us do this and that. God has conversations with the members of the host in other places, in Genesis, in Eden. They're there, we're there. God's original plan was to have these two families together. You realize what that means? It means humanity was created to be fit for God's presence. That's the original plan. They're not barred from entry. They belong there. The most normal thing in God's mind is for humans to be with him. Because his other children are with him. 
He didn't create them to be separate. He created them to be one. This is why at the end of the road in sanctification, in a long, you know, fancy theological term for when we're glorified after death or after the Lord comes, we become like him, like Jesus. We don't, we don't merely become like angels. And we learn why in Hebrews 2, because the second person of the Godhead became a man to redeem man. So we are actually made like him, a little, little bit above them, a little bit above the angels. You know. But we are, we are there together in the new earth. You realize the Bible ends in Revelation the way it began in Genesis. It's just a new Eden, and now it's global. But everybody who's there belongs there. It's the most normal thing to think in God's mind. The most abnormal thing for God to think is that his family is estranged from him. Both his supernatural family members rebel and his human family members rebel. They turn their backs on the things God wants them to have because they want autonomy. They want control. They want self-rule. They want it so badly that they're willing to throw away all that they have to think they're in control of their own lives, their own situations. They make their own autonomous decisions. That's abnormal for, you know, in God's mind. That's what he doesn't want. Again, the, the plural's co-representation is the key idea. Let's talk a little bit about rebellion and evil. Now, when, whenever I jump into this, the question naturally comes up, well, didn't God know what that was going to happen? Of course God knew that was going to happen. He's an omniscient being. Of course he knows what's going to happen. Well, you know, then why did he do it? Why did, why did he make us? It's, it's, it's a related question is, why is there evil? Can't God just get rid of evil? If he doesn't get rid of evil, he can't be good. You know why God doesn't get rid of evil? How many of you are X-Files fans? This is going to date me a little bit. Okay. There's this wonderful episode in the X-Files where Mulder and Scully find a genie, you know, rolled up in the carpet. Okay. And Mulder figures out, this is a genie, like, like in Aladdin. And so the genie says, well, congratulations, numbskull, you get three wishes. Okay. And so his first wish, it, it's, it's the... It's the you know, caricature wish. I want world peace. <laughs> and then Mulder goes outside of the room that they're in, and everybody's gone. <laughs> and he, and he's, he's running down the street, Scully! Scully! Surely Scully's here! You know, it's like, nope. Got any more wishes? <laughs> you know? So, it's a good illustration Yes, God could wipe out evil like that. But to do it, he has to wipe out all the beings he has made who are like him. Because when we're created as God's imagers, and when they were created as God's imagers, you know, they're co-imagers just in different realms, they are his representatives. Well, to do the job of sort of being God, being a partner with God, to do that job, God shared his attributes with us. In theology, they're called communicable attributes. That's your impressive theological term for the day. Okay? They're attributes God shares. Creativity, intelligence, rationality, emotions, and freedom. Free will. You can't eliminate that one and keep the rest of them because then you wouldn't really be like God, would you? Free will is actually essential to imaging. To the whole concept. Now, God knew that, you know what? I still think this is a really good idea because it's what I want. I see the end goal. I want a, a, a human family, an earthly family with my supernatural family. 
I want them together. I want to enjoy them par partnering with me in their realm like I enjoy you partnering with me in the supernatural realm. I want a family. It's, it's the natural impulse of God to want a family and to want partners. But I know that when I make them as my imagers and I share my attributes, I also am aware of one other thing. They're not me. They're like me, but they're not me. That means they lack my perfect nature. That means at some point, they're going to abuse the good gifts that I've given them. And God's right. Rebellion happens in the supernatural realm, and it happens in the earthly realm. Now, what does it tell you about God, though? You say, well, that's not very satisfying because... Because look at all the misery, look at all the, the violence, look at all the bad stuff in the earth, you know, and we look at all the suffering. Since we know that wasn't what God intended, God hates it too. But here's the, here's the key point. In God's mind, and you can blame God for this decision if you like. In God's mind, the terrible things that would result from his initial decision to make us was better than not having us at all. You know, at the end of the day, God makes that call. Now, you can sit there and be the proud atheist and say, well, I would rather not exist. Yeah. Well, then why don't you just go out and you know, jump off a bridge then? You know, show us the, the commitment to your own statement. You know, here's a truck coming by, let's have it, okay? They're lying to you. They're just trying to win a debate. Okay, we, and we have to have, you know, we want life. Life is a, is, is a wonderful thing. And even with suffering, I mean, some of the people who suffer the most will tell you that life is a wonderful thing because they, they kind of know, you know, from one end to the other. And, you know, we have to come to grips with suffering. That's why we were created to be family, to be a community, to alleviate the suffering of family members, to alleviate the suffering of other imagers of God. If you looked at people this way, you might actually, you know, get off your butt and do something, okay? You know, let, let's be honest. I, I often compare, or, and you all know the difference here. And again, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be critical of just church in general. Uh, again, not every, not every place I've been in church, you know, it hasn't been this experience, but I've seen it. A lot of churches tend to treat people, and even a lot of small groups, a lot of Christians, tend to treat the collective like it's a business instead of a family. You know you would think differently if you had some person in church come up to you and say, you know, I can't pay my rent this month. I don't know what I'm going to do. If that was your brother, you'd know what to do. Okay? If that was your sister, you wouldn't even have to think twice about it. It's, it's, it's a whole different mental dynamic. Okay, that, that is how God looks at us. That's the kind of thing God has as an expectation. If we will get it into our heads, again, if we would, if we would think of ourselves the way God thinks of us, okay, as, as humans, and especially within the church, because we're no longer estranged, we are redeemed, we are brought back into the family, we have the Holy Spirit to assist us, we have other people who are like-minded, this should be the most normal thing in the world. And, and you know, if it actually happened, and when it happens, because it does happen, if it actually happened with frequency, do you think people would notice? Of course they notice, because it's abnormal. Okay, it's not the norm. It gives you a little taste of what life should be like, again, in, in God's world. It all goes back to this imaging concept. And yes, there's evil and there's suffering, but again, God was willing to be grieved himself. You think you're, you're, you're grieved about suffering because of the stuff you see in the world? God sees everything. Okay, you don't have anything up on God. 
you don't have a greater awareness of the, of the misery and the suffering of the world than, than God does. He is fully aware. This is why Scripture, God hates evil. It grieves him. Now, did he know it was going to happen? Yeah, he did. But that was preferable than never having us at all. You know, it's, that that is, is just God's nature. Now, God is actively trying, working with people, through people, to be his agents. Again, and, and, and it's the redeemed that can function in this way, the, the way that, that it was all intended to work. God is actively engaged with people to bring estranged imagers back into the family. We call that evangelism, okay, giving them the gospel. And then building a community where suffering is alleviated. It's never going to be totally removed because that's the age to come. But in this age, we have to try to address it. Again, this is what God wants. Now, the, the question that goes with this is, you know, you inevitably wind up in this predestination, you know, conversation. Let me just click out to a verse because I think this one's really important too. Yeah, God knew what was going to happen. Well, well then if he foreknew it, he, then he, this is what God wants. He predestinated it. He wants suffering. He's corrupt. He's evil. You know, he's this, that, and the other thing. Well, really? I think you're making some assumptions there. And I love to go to this passage. It's not the only one of its kind, but I think it's the clearest. This is David at Kyla. And you say, good grief. I know who David is, but, you know, Kyla, I'm probably going to forget that name. It's okay. Just remember the story. David is fleeing from Saul, like he does most of the time, okay, until he becomes king. Let me just read through the passage. Now they told David, you know, somebody tells David, behold, the Philistines, who I like to characterize as the Klingons of the Old Testament, okay, <laughs> The Philistines are fighting against Kyla and are robbing the, the threshing floors. That's where they store food. That's, that's bad because people like to eat. At least I do. Okay. Therefore, David inquired of the Lord, should I go up and attack these Philistines? And the Lord said to David, go and attack the Philistines and save Kyla. But David's men said to him, behold, we're afraid here in Judah. I mean, how much more than if we go to Kyla against the armies of the Philistines? So they're safe in Judah they're holed up, you know, that's, they're, they're away from Saul's gang. You know, they're a small group. Saul has a whole army. If they leave the, the relative safety of where they're at and they go up to the Philistines and they're kind of exposed, plus it's the Philistines. They're just nasty. So David says, well, let me go ask God again. David inquired of the Lord again, and the Lord answered him, get up, <laughs> arise, go down to Kilah, for I will give the Philistines into your hand. Translation, just tell your men not to worry. David and his men went to Kyla and fought with the Philistines and brought away their livestock and struck them with a great blow. So David saved the inhabitants of Kyla. David's the hero. He saves the city. When Abiathar, the son of Ahimelech, had fled to David to Kyla, so this is another character in the bigger story of David, he hears that David's you know, going to Kyla, so he wants to go down and talk, you know, talk there. He had come down with an ephod in his hand. This is probably part of the breastplate of the high priest. Again, this is after the Mosaic era. <clears throat> but it's, it's the thing, one of the things that God had told them to use to ask questions of God, to inquire of God. So the, the priest comes down. It was told Saul that David had come to Kilah. So not only does Ahimelech hear, but Saul hears that David is in Kilah. We don't know how he heard, but he gets wind of this. And Saul's like, oh, this is awesome. Saul said, God has given him into my hand, for he has shut himself in by entering a town that has gates and bars. That David is a moron. Okay, why is that a big deal? Because David's inside the city. It has gates and bars. You know what Saul's going to do? This is siege warfare. You just take your men down there, and you surround the city, and then you wait. You cut off food going in. You cut off water going in. And you just wait. And you say, the people in your city will get to eat and drink when we get David. Hand him over, and we're out of here. Life goes back to normal. So Saul's like, this idiot 
has entered into a walled city. Saul summoned all the people to war to go down to Kila to besiege David. Let's go back up here a little bit. Okay. Saul summoned all the people to go to war to go down to David, or to go down to Kila to besiege David and his men. David knew, so now David somehow hears, that Saul has found out and he's plotting harm against him. And he said to Abiathar the priest, hey, better bring the ephod over here. I have some questions for God. So then David said, O Lord, the God of Israel, your servant has surely heard that Saul seeks to come to Kila to destroy the city on my account. Will the men of Kila surrender me into his hand? Will Saul come down as your servant has heard? So he asked two questions. Is Saul going to come down here? And when he does, will the men of the city turn me over to Saul? O Lord, the God of Israel, please tell your servant. There. Okay, I'm getting lost here. There we go. Come on. Right here. Okay, please tell your servant. And the Lord said, he will come down. Then David said, will the men of Kila, I mean, he asked it again. Will the men of Kila surrender me and my men into the hand of Saul? And the Lord said, yep, they will surrender you. They're going to hand you over. Now, what, if you were David, what would you do? You would do what David does. Uh, let's get out of here. <laughs> David leaves. And if we read the rest of the chapter, we have realized Saul hears that too, and he turns around and goes home. But do you get the point? God foreknew two things that never happened. Saul does not get to the city, and the men do not hand David over, because David ain't there. Foreknowledge does not necessitate predestination. Okay, God foreknows two things that never happen. If they were predestinated, they'd have to happen. So don't go blaming God for wanting evil. You can blame God for giving you life and making you like him, which included the attribute of freedom. But you can only blame yourself for abusing the good gift of God. Okay? That's the point. So if you, if you take this back to Genesis, what does God want? He wants a family. God knows, again, pardon the pun, the fallout of the decision. He knows that evil is going to arise up because we're not him. We like him, but we're not him. But God would rather have us and have that circumstance develop and be grieved by it even more than we are than never have us at all. The, the, the problem, you know, the disconnect for us is we don't, not only don't we look at a, we don't look at other people this way. We don't even look at ourselves that way. You know, it, it, Stovall, I know, talks a lot about, and, and, you know, I talk a lot about identity and mission. It all goes back to this. God wants humans in his family. He wants humans sharing space with his presence. That is the most normal condition for God when he thinks of humans because that is what he originally planned. God's work, and we're going to talk about in the next session, that we're going to talk about the rebellions and the meta narrative and how rebellions just, especially supernatural rebellion, just sort of change the landscape and how that leads up to the mission of Jesus and our mission as, as imagers of Jesus. But that whole you know, set of circumstances, what God wants never changes. There was never a plan B. There is only plan A. Because the meta narrative of Scripture is going to be, now that we've had rebellion, now that we've had the fall, and we've had, there's going to be more than one 
fall, more than one supernatural rebellion, more than one human rebellion. Now that we have the, essentially the world, you know, going to hell in the handbasket, as the idiom, you know, we, we use to express it, just this total chaos, God doesn't say, I must have had a bad day. Maybe I can fix this with some other plan. There is no other plan. So the story of the Bible is God trying to return humanity back to recover its identity, to bring people back into the family, and then partner with him to repeat the process. That's what it's all about. And we are constantly thwarted by supernatural enemies and the humans that are deceived by those supernatural enemies and the effects that the supernatural rebellion has on us to impede God getting his way. <laughs>